Uh, so first of all, thank you all, to all of you for coming here. Uh, for some of you, it might be quite a trek. Uh, so I really appreciate it. I know when I go to these things, I'm sometimes sitting there thinking, I really hope that whoever's speaking makes it worthwhile. So I apologize if I don't. Hang in there. Um, so when Paresh, Paresh asked me to speak, I was like, sure, yeah, I can talk about education. But then he said, speak about what's going right. And I don't know how many of you in the development sector know this, but it's very difficult for a lot of us to speak about what's going right, since most of our lives are built on trying to fix what's going wrong. And so I spent a lot of time actually speaking to experts, similar to uh, Aditya, but I didn't speak to him, about what was going right. And uh, surprisingly, the first minute of our conversation was about what was going right, and the remaining 20 minutes continued to be about what was going wrong. So I did my own thinking and some research and just reflected on a few years that I've been here and seen the sector move. So all of this is about being optimistic. So, everybody close your eyes. No cheating, yeah? Close your eyes, and for 30 seconds, because we don't have too much time, I want you to imagine a government school, and imagine within this school what you would want. What would you imagine in terms of the classroom, the teachers, the children, imagine the walls, the books, their faces. And we're just going to take a few seconds for you to imagine that. OK, now. What did you see? Give me a sense of what you saw. Somebody. Only one word, please. One or two words. What did you see, Pranish? Laughter. OK. Anybody else? Friendliness. OK. Color. Color. Play. Play. Space. So, space? OK. Harmony. Harmony. Sonia. <laughs> Books. Okay. <laughs> Good. Two more. Questions. Questions. Okay. Children play. Playing. Lena. Group work. Okay, great. Now, I have a video that I'm going to show you. You're going to need to hang in there. It's six minutes, okay? But the, the reason that I wanted to show this to you is it's what Liz and Sunil Mehta imagined a school could be, and it's actually become a reality. And I want you to be able to go through this video, but I want you to listen for some key words. Child-centric education, community teachers, teacher training, laughter, fun, play, partnership with governments, student ratios, and learning outcomes. And the reason I'm throwing these words out you, because a lot of you don't have your notebooks out, but I want you to learn something before you leave this session, because it's a fun day Friday. Friday, fun day. I want you to be able to pick up these words, because these are the buzzwords for the future of this sector. It's what everybody uses to describe whether it's working or it's not. So let's look at this video. Muktanglan, a Mumbai-based NGO, has created a model of low-cost, quality school education in partnership with the Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai within the mainstream government system. Catering to the needs of underserved communities, Muktangan simultaneously provides school and teacher education for the local community. Muktangan was started because it became, to me, essential to really demonstrate what child-centeredness in education could be. In Muktangan, we believe that every child develops in a different way, in a different sequence, at a different speed, and children learn from active engagement in learning experiences. Funded by the Paragon Charitable Trust, the first Muktangan class was set up for toddlers in a tiny room on the premises of a municipal school. And since then, the Muktangan family has grown from strength to strength, with support from the community and the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation. Today, Muktangan runs seven municipal schools and trains around 100 community teachers every year. 
With a commitment for further expansion, all seven schools will soon be taken up to Standard 10. Fun and education go hand in hand at Muktangan, with an innovative, holistic curriculum being followed. Children participate in interesting activities, ensuring active learning of the academic elements of their syllabus. So this egg is how much? One quill. Equal importance is given to exciting outdoor learning trips, physical education and the performing arts as well. Every child is treated as an equal at Muktangan, including differently abled children who receive individual attention from specialized staff members. With teachers and students belonging to the same community, an instant bond is struck, making student-centered teaching an easy task. What makes Muktangan's teaching methods even more effective is the average of a 10 is to 1 student-teacher ratio. At any given time, three groups are taught independently in each classroom, enabling the teacher to focus on the individual needs of each child. Each of these dedicated teachers undergoes a special one-year intensive pre-service training at Muktangan, during which they also spend time as interns in classrooms. This is followed by a one-year residency course, which helps them integrate theory with practice. Muktangan trainees are also given rigorous training in English, inclusive practices and child observation. Was the past of swim? Swam. Swam. I joined as a trainee in Muktangan seven years back and currently I'm working as a faculty in charge of one of the BMC school. Muktangan is a magical castle which opened uh, windows of opportunity to all the people from the community and I am one of them. The Muktangan family also includes parents of the students in its fold as stakeholders to help them understand how their children learn at school. Regular interactive forums are held. Parents ko bhi wo log English English speaking sikha hai aur teacher training bhi parents ka liya hai. Kabi chance mila to zaroor Muktangan ke school mein teacher banungi. It is no surprise that these students love to attend school and express themselves freely with confidence. In Muktangan, we are like a family and we can share our feelings with everyone. Offering quality education to the slum child and providing teacher education for disadvantaged members of the community, Muktangan's approach to education has created a unique model which can easily be replicated within the larger school education-based system. Thousands of well-wishers are being added to the Muktangan family every year. And what began as a single person's vision has today manifested itself into a full-fledged movement. The education gap in Mumbai is very wide. Muktangan addresses this gap by working very closely with the municipal corporation. My wife and I uh, decided to help the teacher training initiative because we were very impressed with Muktangan's educational focus, the way they're delivering things in a very professional manner, and their commitment to focus on outcomes and give the children a great educational experience. to show you Muktangan is um, it basically we selected Muktangan from a research-led process because I want to move into a bit of how DASA works and how we ultimately find uh, such impactful organizations like Muktangan. 
So our research-led process for this particular, uh, we call them investments, although we provide them grant funding, uh, started with a research report called Making the Grain. This was about two years ago. Um, but I wanted to take the opportunity to encourage you to not only go and read this research report, since a lot of the issues still stand uh, today, but also to highlight um, within this report, there are nine very strong organizations that you can read about, learn about, uh, see the leadership there and the change that they're focusing on and should some way you want to be involved and these are some uh, other organizations that are working on different parts of improving the uh, education system. And so as we move to understand uh, Dasra's model, Dasra is a word in Sanskrit that means enlightened giving. We started Dasra 14 years ago. Uh, and now have grown uh, to about 60 people. And our focus really is on two sides, and, and through this web, um, basically you'll see the green side is working on the, with philanthropists and those who are giving, and the other color working more with the nonprofits. And largely we play a facilitation role. Over the 14 years, we've probably worked with around 500 uh, philanthropists. We've done about 22 different research reports, and we're sector agnostics, which means we've done reports in education and health, around sanitation, and we use that to be able to inform those who are giving as to where their funding can be most impactful, and being able to identify high-performing and high-potential organizations, and we use that research process to be able to identify those uh, organizations and really to use the report to frame and, and educate others within that ecosystem. So it's largely a facilitation role. The idea being that as we work with the philanthropists, we try to convince them to join our giving circles, and Muktangin is one of our giving circles uh, from the Making the Grade report, and Louis Miranda is actually in that giving circle. And then on the other end, we start to work with nonprofits. We have an executive education program called Dasser Social Impact, that we work with a cohort of organizations on their business plans. And then we ultimately have a core group of organizations, the 10 that you see as sector leaders. And these are organizations in our portfolio, similar to Mukdang, in that we work with over three to five years, providing the capacity building that you see there. So there are other organizations that are somewhat similar to Basra that have popped up, and we call ourselves intermediaries. Uh, and are trying to really build an ecosystem around giving as well as helping uh, organizations, specifically in the education sector as well. And so what I'm optimistic about, and I want you to be, is reach out and see that these organizations actually exist. And so my talk really wasn't a whole lot about Basra, I and mean, I'd love to stand here and talk about all the great work that we're trying to do, but it's really to try to leave you with factors that I feel are actually driving success in the education sector. And so the first uh, factor that I want you to be able to remember, so there's only five, so you can remember the five. The first five is policy. In the country, surprisingly, from any other sector, the education sector has actually gotten a lot, uh, gained a lot of ground due to policy. Everybody's probably heard of the Rights to Education Act, and that has helped quite significantly in catalyzing accountability. This came in around August 2009. And it's really trying to improve learning outcomes and learn, looking at how to improve school level. And the Planning Commission is now trying to set goals around this by states uh, in the 12th plan. So we're starting to see that this policy is actually gaining some traction, although there is some controversy, no doubt, around it. But the other two um, pieces I've put up there, SSA, Sarva Shiksha Avyan, was all around universalizing education. And then the midday meal scheme now, where there's 87% uh, in these schools, moves to the next factor that has really pushed and has really helped us is enrollment. Now, I know all of you mean, are thinking there, well, what's the point of enrollment if no one's learning anything? But actually getting kids into the school is a big achievement we've, we have achieved. And in the past four years, it's been around 96%. Now, this is no small feat. With 230 million kids going to school in 1.3 million schools, this is more than the population of a number of countries. So, you know, when we look and talk about the greatness of Norway, you know, it's not that hard when you're such a small country without the number of children and the magnitude of what we're trying to solve here. So we can be positive by the factor that we're achieving enrollment. Now, both SSA, Service Ikshya Avyan, has really actually helped infrastructure. So the third factor I put out there is infrastructure. We've seen enrollment actually increase for girls, around 20% um, in the last few years. And some of it may have come 
from the reason for dropout is there's no toilet specifically for girls. We're starting to see that schools have around 50% as a separate toilet. There actually are 75% with toilets, also drinking water, and half of them are starting to have playgrounds. So some infrastructure improvements are coming, and I think what's most exciting is a lot of it is coming from ownership within the community that's using the school development committees to reach out and get the money that they need to be able to improve these infrastructures. So that's the third point. Moving to the next, yet somewhat controversial, is this whole growth in private schools. The number of government schools in and of itself are increasing, which is promising, and we're seeing that there is a corresponding drop in the ratio of student to teacher ratio. But some of the concern is that this ratio may be driven by children moving into the private school system. Now the reason that I've put this as a you know, potential factor that's moving in the right direction is I'm starting to really believe that as the private schools gain ground, there will be pressure on government schools to improve their quality as they start to see momentum building on the private school side. And, and if this kind of growth continues, it's expected in 2018 that more than 50% of the children will be attending these private schools. So you know, I'm clearly seeing that as factor number four. And let's see the last factor, data. It may seem like a very simple thing, but the fact that USER, the Pratham survey is out there, the fact that the All India Education survey is out there, the fact that NCRT has the National Sample Survey, there's just more information for people to hold each other and the government accountable. And it's remarkable because as we see these numbers, we're able to tailor policies, tailor funding, and we're able to hopefully see learning outcomes and other things actually really improve, both at a policy, schools, community, as well as yourselves. And so I just want to summarize by saying these are the five factors that I see are really something we can be optimistic about. The reason I said optimistic, how many of you know the up cartoon? Yes? No? Sorry? Okay, okay. That's why it's optimistic. But these are the five factors that I think are really important for us. I'd love for you to go away and repeat them and just remember that we're moving in the right direction. But the reason that I've put little Russell at the mi in the middle of this, he was a wilderness explorer that helped Grandpa um, take the balloons to the waterfall, is that education is a shared responsibility. And I think what's exciting is that it's moved beyond class, beyond caste, beyond wealth. It's one of the priorities for almost all of the philanthropists that we work with. And to have all of you here clearly shows that this is a sector we can move and it's something to be optimistic about. So we have someone great to hear from after me who's just done an unbelievable job in actually transforming. So I'm going to hand over to Aditya. Bastra has also got a lot of reports that come on your way out you can take. You stack them up there, so if anyone wants to read the reports, please grab a copy on your way out. Hello. Hi. How are you? How are you feeling? Optimistic. Already? <laughs> How many people from Godrej here? Yeah? Just hands up. Okay. How many people from college here? Yeah? Okay. Just to get a quick feel for the audience. So I used to be in college a uh, long time ago in Bombay. Do you do NSS still? Feeding the blind, all that sort of stuff. The college. Hello. Yeah. I need to flail my hands, but. Uh, so I was in college thinking, you know, I did my BCom here from Sydney uh, 20 years ago. Parmesh and I were classmates actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was like a lot of people, typical middle class, wanted to do something useful, we went and prayed to the blind, went and taught at some orphanage, volunteered at some vendor affair, did the usual NSS stuff. But somehow I felt something more needed to be done than that. Uh, so I told my dad, you know, I think I'm going to go into teaching. 
patient man, he sort of listened a little bit, but then slowly convinced me out of it, said you'll never earn your living, you know, do something more useful. Uh, I went and did my chartered accountancy again, you know, I was reasonably okay at it, but just didn't have any sense of meaning. Uh, I'm mean, good at manipulating numbers, but wanted to interact with people more. And again, I thought about after that, what am I going to do if I pass my exam? I was going to go and do something more useful uh, than that. And uh, then I went, I worked at KPMG for a few years, uh, did my MBA, I worked in London for a small startup, and uh, this sort of knowing thought was always there behind me, saying, you know, I come from a family which has been extremely privileged by education. Uh, my grandfather was one of 11 children, and my father is one of 44 first cousins. And, uh, you know, only four people went to college from my grandfather's generation because two people used to work to send one person to college. And as a result, in the cousins, I have cousins, you know, the cousins also automatically. My grandfather got educated because two other people worked to send him through college. And so therefore my father got educated and uh, I got even better education. Whereas in other parts of the family, there wasn't as much education. So I saw inside my own family, I mean like today I have members within, I must be having some 200 odd second cousins. And I saw within my own family people who were investment bankers in New York, uh, earning a million dollars a year, and people who are below poverty line here living off ration cards. And every time I met people, I met the whole, this thing was inside my own family, which means there's no difference in gene pool, exactly the same gene pool. It's just difference in opportunity. And this used to frustrate the shit out of me because, you know, like, what is this? I mean, how can it be that, you know, just some people get options? So when you think, when people applaud the fact that, oh, you've done so much, I've not done so much. The only thing is that I've got opportunity. And so I always wondered, and so it was wonderful because uh, within the family, my father continued to support other people, uh, his cousins, saying that they didn't get the opportunity, so he supported. And so it's wonderful. So within the larger family, people support each other. But I wondered, what is the limitation of this family? Why am I supporting people within my own gene pool? I mean, does it really matter whether it's my gene pool or someone else's gene pool just because same gene pool, should I support them? Shouldn't we be, I mean, what is family? Uh, and a lot of these people I didn't even know. And that just got me thinking, saying, you know, what is my role in the universe? Why am I here? What am I doing? And uh, so suddenly one day in London, I just quit my job, uh, came back to India. I told my dad I was coming for a holiday because otherwise you would have convinced me not to have quit my job and to continue there. Uh, the earthquake had just happened in Kutch uh, and so I decided to go and volunteer there for six months. Uh, it was very unsexy for my father until now he could tell his, you know, his peer group that you know, my son just done his MBA, he's working in London, it's a startup, it's high potential and suddenly now he was roaming around in Kutch uh, doing some education stuff. But that was really a transformative experience for me. I was an urban kid that largely lived in urban cities in India and uh, I roamed around over a hundred villages in Kutch at that time. And I don't know how many of you have ever done post, uh, you know, trauma relief and stuff like that, post uh, disaster. But you, you really get churned like crazy. If there's one thing that's worth doing in your life before you die, like hundred best experiences, that's one thing you have to do. It really makes you question everything. Because every house I went to had someone who had died. Every house I went to had a paraplegic. There were houses into which I went where the earning member of the family had died, which means there was a woman and three young kids. Uh, she had no skills. How were they going to survive? So, I, uh, one of the things that they say in post-earthquake relief is to restart schools is very important because it gives you a sense of normalcy in the rehabilitation, right? Because your children go at 9 o'clock, come back at 2 o'clock every day, you start believing that life is normal. Otherwise, the trauma keeps going again and again in your head. But the problem in Kutch was the fact that 85% of the government schools in Kutch had teachers from other districts. Because Kutch is a very low literacy place, there were no teachers there, so the government had put people from other districts. So which means as soon as the earthquake happened, all these teachers got themselves transferred back to their home districts. You know, to Mayasana and to Patan and stuff. They said, why should we stay here? Because the aftershocks continued for 12, 16, 18 months after that. So not only had the schools collapsed, because as you remember it happened on 26th of January, so schools had collapsed, right? Children had seen their peers die in the school and the teachers had disappeared. 
this is not a great situation to be in, right? And uh, so, one of the things we were starting is we were just going to the individual thing. We started something called alternative schooling. So basically, we go to the youth in the community and young people who had, you know, sort of started college but come back there and uh, you know, didn't have jobs. And we said, why don't you start teaching the kids something? Because we can't wait for the teachers to come back. They don't even come back. Why don't you just get the 20 kids in your village and start teaching something? And so like this village to village, we used to get the communities together to start teaching. Just their own kids. Because you know basic language and math, at least get people involved in something. Because otherwise the trauma just continues in your head. Uh, so we did this in over 600, 700 villages in touch. And there was one particular village uh, in which one of my colleagues came and told me, so is Gaumito, you know, impossible. The principal is just not letting us start an alternative school there. So I said, why would anyone object to something like this? It seems quite nondescript. It's not even controversial. It's only for children. So he said, no, 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 you have to come. I've tried three times. He's unwilling. So I went, I said, okay, let's go and try and meet this man. That was one of the most transformative two days in my life. Because I went and met this gentleman, spoke to him for four or five hours. He was a government school principal. Right? He was not from Kutch. He was posted outside of Kutch. But post the earthquake, he actually asked for a transfer into Kutch. Not only into Kutch, he purposely chose a block called Rapper, which is one of the worst blocks in Kutch. I mean, it's like complete desert. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, there's no way you can get agriculture. So the communities are really uh, badly off. Uh, not only did he transfer himself there, he brought his family there as well. He said, you know, the others, I'll be tempted to keep going back on the weekend. He brought his family there as well. And the school there, which before the earthquake had only 87 children, post the earthquake had 125 children. Just because of this one man. Because what he went around doing was, he got the community together and said, listen, let's stop crying. We have to do something for ourselves. We can't be waiting for the world to come and save us. So why don't each of you volunteer time, let's build up at least a basic school premises. And he got the place cleaned up and he got the community to build the premises. He went to UNICEF and he fought and he somehow got some textbooks. He said, come on, what the hell are you doing? When is the distribution going to happen? I want it. He went to the local electrician and he fought and he said, is it more important for the sarpanch to have electricity or for the children to have electricity? And he got electricity there. He went and found a few youth members and he said, anyway, you're sitting around doing nothing, come, why don't you start teaching? He found a few old women and he said, why don't you also sit here, at least take care of the younger kids. And he just got the whole community going. And the school was like, you know, it was a really fantastic school. And when I asked him, sir, why are you doing this? He said, well, the government gives me a salary to serve this nation. And so I'm serving the nation. That's all. I mean, he didn't even think it was something outstanding to do. Here I was, you know, this big chip on my shoulder. I've just come back to London, from London to save this country, you know. I'm roaming around, feeling very proud of myself. And here is this unsung hero, just quietly doing what he's supposed to do. And so I actually blogged about that. That was my first blog that I ever wrote uh, in 2002. Uh, and because it affected me. You know, it affected me. And uh, I just blogged about him, saying that, you know, all we need in this country is seven lakh idiots like him. Because there are seven lakh villages in this country. And uh, this guy was an idiot. I mean, there's no way you can justify what he's done. It doesn't seem rational from any of our points of view. But he was finding meaning from it. I mean, he wasn't doing it out of a sense of sacrifice. This is how he thought you had to live life. Right? Uh, and he was getting joy from what he was doing. And so, the question that started coming in my mind was, could you create 700,000 idiots like this? Is there a systematic process by which you can create people like this? Because it clearly seems like there are lots of people like this in a society. For the next five years, I worked for an organization called Pratham. I roamed around a lot of villages in Gujarat, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, uh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Bihar, UP, Urissa. I must have seen over 500 schools. And I saw this pattern again and again. I saw the fact that in schools where there were leaders who were motivated, positive, constructive, resilient. The schools always had energy. They had positivity and they were working and they were progressing. And in schools in which the leader was negative, cynical, felt disempowered and wasn't doing anything, that would be the way the teachers spoke, that would be the way the children spoke. And there was no difference in the community between both these. I mean, there's no difference between one village and another village. The same community exists, 
one principal will tell you, oh sir, nothing can happen, you know, these people don't send anybody to school, you know, they are illiterate, you know, they come in dirty. The other guy would say, you know, that's the opportunity. They are illiterate, that's why I am here. So they take everything that I give them, they are so constructive, you know, they are very thankful to me. It's the same situation, but just someone seeing the class as half full and someone seeing it as half empty. So across the board I saw this standard pattern, 15 to 20 percent of schools which I went to had these positive constructive people. The bottom 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent were the ones that get reported in the media because they are the ones with the political connection, they are the ones who are not doing anything productive, stuff like that. So that's the one that gets reported. And the middle 60 percent is your typical, what I call myself, like typical Indian middle class, which is do as much as necessary till your boss out for you. Right? So you don't do too much positive, you don't do too much negative. Uh, just keep it going, you know, keep the, keep the states going. That's the simple part. And so my real question was, could you build, could you take that 60% and make them have the habits of mind that the top 20% have? Could you build in those habits in this thing? Right. So I spent over 14 months looking across the world, I went to Netherlands, UK, Singapore, Korea, everywhere, looking at what sort of programs were they running to build their principles. I mean, many of, my father went to a Don Bosco in, in Matunga actually, and this, the principal of Don Bosco still remembers him 25 years later, right? That's the sort of passion with which people taught at Don Bosco, right? And if that, <coughs> the principals in some of the government schools I went to don't know their children's names today, forget, you know, 25 years later. So that was sort of the difference. And what is it? It's just a difference in an individual. If you feel value, you start learning, you start contributing, you start engaging. That was critical. So I said, can you create those sort of Don Bosco like Father Appai at Don Bosco, could you create that Father Appai again and again? Uh, so we collaborated, I was in Ahmedabad in those days, we collaborated with Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad, we collaborated with a couple of NGOs, with Mercer, Human Resource Consulting, they had got some strategy, they had got some frameworks, competence frameworks for how to build leadership, we worked together and we tried to launch a program, uh, I ran around looking for money uh, to try and get the whole thing going, but basically to cut a long story short, we, we started with a group of 80 principals in Rajasthan, um, we went and sold it to the government, we said, you know, your principles come and laughed at us and you think our principles are going to change. Why? So we said, not only will they change, but they will volunteer for this program. So now you're completely nuts. No government school is going to volunteer for this program. So we said, no, let's go and try it. So we signed an MOU with the state government and we went in, we marketed to a group of principles. And we in fact didn't provide any incentives, we provided just the opposite. We said, we're going to give you nothing, no financial benefit as a result of coming for this program. Right? There's going to be no recognition as a result of this program. Right? You're not going to get any additional leave. In fact, the only thing you're going to get is more work to do. Right? But we know that you want to do good. Because every day you're seeing those children. We know that deep down inside you, there is a need to contribute. And we know you've just forgotten it. And you know that it just got sort of killed somewhere in the last 25 years. And if that's the case, enroll for the program. Right? 50% of people enrolled for the program. The government refused to believe it. We went and took back the application form and said 50% of people are willing to do this. Nowadays, in fact, when we market, 93 to 97% of people join the program. Right? That's the potential. Like I told you, the 10% is always difficult, the bottom 10%. But, you know, 93% of people enroll voluntary for the program, do additional workshops, do additional homework, do additional work all the time. Right? That's the potential. So we worked with that group uh, and we did a whole bunch, we do, a, our model is built with a combination of workshops, which means 12 days of workshops over the year, 4 days before Diwali, 4 days after Diwali, 4 days just in February, March, uh, and then 16 days of on-site coaching. So a young person comes in and works with you uh, on every Monday or every Tuesday saying, sir, what is the problem, how can I work with you? So almost like an executive assistant you would have in, a, uh, in any change management process. So we'd come in and we said, okay, the executive management EAs can exist in the corporate world, why can't they exist here? So someone comes in and helps you, uh, you know, manage the change process. So this is a principal who otherwise, I mean, the problem in the government school is that the senior most teacher just gets promoted to principal overnight. Which means one day you were teaching physics and the next day suddenly you're the principal of the school. There's no training, there's no nothing, right? So what you basically done is you've lost a good physics teacher and you've got a bad principal. You've lost, you've got double whammy there, right? Because the principal job is completely different. He's got to handle the teacher politics. Uh, she's got to somehow manage how the community's interaction, the community's expectation. She's got to manage the administration of the whole thing. 
she's got to get the whole school going in a particular direction. Completely different skill from managing a group of 20 children. Right? And no one's listening. I mean, that's why you have the MBA program in the regular corporate thing. You don't build the, every average shop floor engineer doesn't just become, with no additional skilling, doesn't become the plant manager or the engineer or the designer or the faculty. These are different skills. So we designed a three-year part-time like an executive MBA program, you know, which had a combination of uh, workshops, like I said, 12 days and on-site coaching in order to help the principal uh, evolve his or her skills and actually show change in the school. Uh, the leadership program has four different components. It has a combination of what we call personal leadership, which is managing your own motivation, your own sense of meaning making, where you're coming from. This is very critical because, for example, uh, you know, once you realize that as a principal, typically you become principal at the age of 42, 43. So it means you've still got about almost 20 years of service left. In those 20 years, you can see an entire generation pass through your school. Right? So it means you can transform everything in that school because People who are coming to your school are going to be 26 when they pass out. Their attitudes are going to be defining what that village is. So it means their attitudes towards women, their attitude towards caste, their attitude towards religion, their attitude towards inclusion, their attitude towards entrepreneurship, everything can be altered by you. We just help principals recognize the beauty of that job. No other job is a paid person given a chance to access every house in the village and transform an entire community. I mean, what a beautiful opportunity. Right? And you've just not seen it like that. You see yourself as an administrator. Right? So that's the personal leadership portion. The second portion is an instructional portion where you teach them about progressive pedagogy because most people are still beating the children, still believe that children are stupid and can't learn. I mean, so I mean, so 1960s. I mean, children have beautiful capabilities. All you need is to provide environments for them to grow. Right? The third portion is organizational leadership where we actually assist them in managing their staff. How do you build a team of your staff uh, and get motivation? And the fourth is the social leadership, which is managing your community. So basically, it's the four relationships that I've ossified. My relationship with myself, my relationship with my children, my relationship with my teachers, and my relationship with my community. Each of these we help slowly improve. And these are ossified, and therefore everyone is stuck in a bad equilibrium. So it's been wonderful. I mean, uh, because as you go on, I mean, you wonder how people change. But the sort of change story that I experienced, I'm just coming back from Rajasthan, actually. Um, and... Uh, you know, one of the principal's called one of the principal's wives called me once, and uh, this is Rajasthan, this feudal Rajasthan, you have to remember. And said, "Apne kya kar diya mere mister ko?" <coughs> so I said, uh, "You know, what's the problem?" So he said, "Pehle to wo sir ghar pe aate the, to rajniti aur paise ke baare mein baat karte the." So when he came back, he used to talk only about money and politics. Abhi wo ghar pe aate hain, to puchte hain ki tum kaisi ho, right? And this is a deep transformation in the individual, because it can't just happen with children. As you link with children, as you link with your own teachers, you have to change as an individual. And this beauty is there inside every person. And the ability to see that beauty and just bring it back into this thing. I mean, I really love the work, therefore, as a result. Uh, similarly, one principal came crying into our workshop. Uh, really crying. I mean, you know, this is a grown man. I don't think he's cried for 20, 30 years at least. And he was just crying. He was sobbing inconsolably. So I just held him and then at the end asked him, what is the problem? So he told me, you should have come 20 years ago. So I said, why? He said, no, I gave up 20 years ago. Uh, for the last 20 years, children have been waiting for me to leave the classroom. Today, for the first time, they were crying when I left the classroom and they said, sir, don't go. This human being had never had the pleasure of someone wanting him. And now that that had happened, he was just so enjoying his job. So, uh, so all individuals can change. I mean, there's one thing that I'm, I, I mean, I'm not even optimistic. I believe this is just realistic. All human beings are just wonderful. I mean, I don't look at this as optimistic. This is my experience of the world. Uh, I mean, I really just see beauty <laughs> on me. So I, maybe that's, maybe I'm deluded, but uh, uh, that's what I see. So I think, so Gandhi had a beautiful saying which says that, don't ever hope to build systems so good that people don't need to be good. You know, we keep trying to make government systems, CAG, this, that, CBI, all this to try and stop. But the real thing is human beings are good, just treat them well, treat them with dignity and you know, things will be okay. We all want to be trusted, we want to be respected, we want to uh, help each other. And I think that's the fundamental premise for anyone who comes on staff. You just essentially believe that human beings are good or not. If you have something negative to say, then you know, 
really go and look at yourself. I mean, where did you get this opinion from? How much experience do you have? That's what we sort of help pass out as we just believe that human beings are beautiful. Uh, so now we've expanded the program substantially. We work with over a thousand schools. We want to demonstrate in the next three years that a thousand government schools can work. Uh, because people have just lost faith. Each of us has lost faith in the government in this country. We don't believe that anything in this country can work if it's government. Uh, but I was just telling Parmesh that one of the things that really affected me 12 years ago when I moved back to India and I started reading was a saying which says, better the tyranny of an autocrat than apathy in a democracy. Right? Better the tyranny of an autocrat than apathy in a democracy. And I really believe that because as citizens, I mean, what is government? I am government. You know, I have to make this work. I can't expect when I'm shouting at a politician, who am I shouting at? He's only another person like me who just chose to be a politician because he didn't know what else to do. I can change this country. The sense of agency that I have, if I don't learn to express it, I have not yet evolved as a citizen. And so my journey of evolving myself as a citizen and seeing I'm so lazy as a citizen. I mean, the work that I do is completely uninspiring because it's a profession. That's all it is. It's just a profession. I do this work like you go and, you know, you go sell cars or someone else is selling soap. I make sure education works. That's all I do. But as a citizen, how do I operate? Do I get involved in my local school committee? Do I get involved when the road is uh, uh, broken over here? Do I get involved in policy decisions? Do I go and meet my municipal councillor and do that? And I think we can only be optimistic if each of us does a bit of that. And being in a democracy in India has got reduced to just voting. Did I vote? That's an extremely small portion, okay? And uh, so I am extremely optimistic because I think young people coming out of India are going to do all this stuff. In the next 25 years, this country will be so rocking, it's not funny. Uh, because all these old phobies like me are going to be out of the way. So I'm leaving you with that thought. Thanks a lot for listening to me and uh, that's all that. We have time for about 10 minutes of questions for both of them. We started with giving a broad out, uh, overview of five things. How many of you remember five things with your kids? Does anyone remember a five points? Okay, so glad people are 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 Remember we said at the beginning that this is a positive, feel good funda. We want to celebrate all that is good about Indian education. Uh, because it is a children's day thing and we really want to celebrate um, the goodness about an India in which our children are living. So if any of you have something to share in terms of exemplars from your own life, um, or you want to ask them questions, this is a great time. Just raise your hands um, and I'll come up to you with the mic if you have. Okay. We have a third mic. Actually, can I just take one of these? Yeah. Uh, in India's education sector, Catholic schools have definitely done a great contribution rather uh, than the government schools. In my place, there are six to seven colleges and uh, compared to one of the government colleges, but that had the least of this family. So, the Catholic institutions have played a vital role in uh, developing and spreading literacy and education in India. Uh, what do you have to say about it? Well, I agree. Absolutely. My mom went to a Catholic school, my sister went to a Catholic school, my father went to a Catholic school. So, <laughs> you know, so, and not just Catholic, I think all religious institutions. I mean, either you went to Aryavidya Mandir or you went to Dham Bosco. Uh, you know, so all the religious institutions, I think, recognized this before the government recognized that it was important. So I think they're very blessed a whole group of people dedicated their lives to education at that time, at that critical phase. And the work that both of them are doing, whether at uh, mapping the ecosystem level or specifically, is whether it's a Catholic or non-Catholic, so how do you make them more efficient? Um, and that's the thing, right? Yeah.
Hi, um, I missed part of the beginning of the talk, but I was really fascinated by what you were talking about because I work in game-based learning systems, so we make playful ways to teach people things, and I've done a lot of work in like leadership design, using playful things and stuff like that. And I wonder if you guys use something like that, like playful interactions or games or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. We in fact do a lot of game-based stuff uh, throughout because a lot of leadership training is uh, so we bring the best. So in fact, we play ultimate frisbee with principals because when you know it's a really unusual thing, and you have to watch women in uh, full this thing suddenly pulling up their saris to win for their teams, and that's the first time they work together as a team versus another school because you try to work in traditional environments, they're not breaking their mindsets. Right? We do community art where principals go and throw color and paint on the wall of the school along with the children. right? And uh, then based on that they have to jointly create some origami, they have to jointly create stuff. So a lot of game based stuff is extremely useful. We play all the typical corporate output bound games with them and it really opens up uh, people's minds because they've never done it before. See they're also they're dull because they're not getting new exposure to new ideas and to new this to new ways of learning. That is just, you know, it stays within the small section of corporate India. Those ideas haven't gone all the way to government. Government trainings are still the old, one guy comes, serves up with a mic, 150 people are sitting there, this guy picks up the mic at 9 o'clock in the morning and he gets off at 4 in the evening. I mean, it's just horrible. So, you know, if I had to sit through that, I would have jumped off the floor of a building. If you want to share your games with him later, you can get more snacks and yeah. you can help. Are there any questions? That's it. Thank you both for that talk, it was really inspirational. I think it was really interesting when I was listening to both of you. I feel like when you gave your presentation, it was more like a top down, so it was like policy that, that eventually affects people on the ground. What you spoke about was more like a bottom up, right? Like people on the ground are trying to have this impact. And I think the question that I'm left with in my head is where do the, where do the two meet? Uh, right now, it seems like the conversations are about policies not allowing people to be most effective in certain ways, or probably what's working, and, and the policies are not working for in the favor of that. And probably the other way around to think about how can how could you have more people who've been on the ground um, trying to influence the decisions that policy makes to have the most amount of impact. What is the best synergy for both? Because right now I feel like, at least from limited reading and interaction that I've had, that there's some breakdown there. That sometimes the policy doesn't allow for people on the ground to be most effective, or people on the ground are probably not. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sad that mine was seemed like a top down, but <laughs> that's not really the work that we do. Um, I think that it's changing in essence. It was an overview. Yes, thanks. <laughs> um, I think the, the whole piece about policy being in an ivory tower and then sort of the, the folks working on the ground and there being a gap, I think that exists. I think that exists in other sectors um, as well. But I think what's changing is that the bottom-up is getting to be much more influential and, and quite powerful in demanding uh, changes. And, and I think as you get people who are both have been on the ground, who cross over sectors, so you know, for ourselves who've moved from the corporate sector here, or people who move from having been on the ground up to influence policy, as you get more crossover there, I feel that there will be a lot more focus on uh, implementation and impact, but I think that's, that's slightly optimistic. I do feel that we could do a lot more in uh, bridging it. It's also in terms of what she shared later about data, right? The more data that you add, the more data that you have. Hi, just uh, one thing. Thanks, both of you, for sharing your insights. Now, when you're speaking about schools, right, I have two things in mind when all of you came. If you the um, example of Muktangal, and of course, I'm aware of the work that you are doing. When you speak about even government schools, okay, they're not very uniform. So if you have a municipality school, you have a Kendiya Vidyala, and then, you know, you have a Kendiya Vidyala at Pawai, and so, 
when we are working about school transformation or we shall we ever consider we as a class to send our children to government school when we are speaking about transformation coming for the youths growing up in the next 25 years in which schools will they study will they go to this air conditioned international schools uh, which are very different or they will come from pluralistic schools or i i don't know i don't find pluralism any longer into the schools and the people who are studying in these schools if they come up with ideas to be in this so called grassroots schools which is for the rest 70% of them then is the transformation really bottom up that's what i must say I, I mean, if for if for a, a minute we cannot be optimistic, I mean the reality is we don't send our our kids to the government schools. And the way that things are going, the poorest of the poorest and most vulnerable kids are going to be in the government schools. So I think that's the reality. Um, I think the idea of how do we improve them and how do we keep them accountable by working through different mechanisms is where we're going to. But I don't have a very Straight answer. I wasn't sure what your question was either, but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there is definitely this segregation that's happening in India. I mean, I wish every school could be as good as you know whatever Tiruva Brahmani or Heritage School or uh, DPS or whatever. Every school, every child deserves that. And there is definitely a segregation happening. Okay, but what are we going to do about it? You consider yourself. What are you doing about it? No, no. I'm asking you. What are you doing about it? That's all. So that's all. Every other debate is irrelevant. So me, what, what you have to do? No? So you do. That's all. I'll do mine. You do yours. Simple. Because anything else is an abstraction. What should we do? Once the word should comes, I think it gets very complicated. You want to do, you do that. Someone else for whom it doesn't matter will not do that. That's all. I don't think we should take a moralistic stand. I don't think this is a free country. Each one should do what they want. People will discover their truth at their own times, and they will do what they want. That is the beauty of where we are. So, no moralism about oh, we need to send our children to government school. I'm not going to send. I mean, I will improve it. That's all. What are we going to do about it? I don't want to have an abstract discussion. It's not uniform now. So, what can you do? That is the only question that's valid, right? Anything else is what the politician should do, what the government should do, what the corporate should do, what the government school teacher should do. But the only thing over which I have power is what I am going to do. So, are you going to become a politician and change that? Are you going to become a government school teacher and change that? Are you going to be a citizen and change that? I think that's the only question that's relevant. Because if we don't act from there and we continue the discussions. Around what other people should do who are outside this room, nothing will ever going to happen, right? So the optimism for me comes from the fact that I can do, I can change this. You can change this. You can change this. You can change this. Each of us has to do. Boon boon se saara banti hai. So what am I going to do? Once we focus on that, rather than what the politician is, so the bottom up, top down, all is irrelevant for me. Today evening you can go back. Tomorrow morning you can go and see the government school in your community. And you can do something about it. If you don't do that, then there's nothing to go and tell the politician about, it, right? I mean, and I don't do that. So then, what am I going to tell the politician? So, as a citizen, I think it's extremely critical. I'm sorry if I'm getting a little this thing about this, but I don't like, yeah, but I don't like abstraction about what other people should do. So what what I should do? And only when we realize that, that's why I said this thing about citizens. What can I do? Right? And if we don't concentrate discussion on I can do, so become a policy person. Go and do your masters in economics. Go to LSC, study the best policy, come back, join the government, you know, change the thing. But still, this is a free country. That's the beauty of this country. It's free. Each individual citizen can decide what he or she wants. So even if I become prime minister, the beauty is I can't force everyone to go to a government school. So that's what I love about this country: complete chaos. Right? <laughs> complete chaos. I mean, that's the beauty. I mean, imagine it. So I don't want to live in a country in which someone else can make my decision. Which means I can't hope to become the leader and force someone else to take my decision either. So that's the beauty. So therefore, the only beauty is that I have agency to do whatever I want with my life, 
and I will slowly discover what is good for all of us. That is the process in which a democracy evolves, by understanding that I should make something which is good for all of us. And that's what we've not yet learned. And I think that's what if we start doing, it will be great. I'm going to take two more questions, but before that, I mean, y'all should interact later with Paul Mead, there's a lot of interesting work with Nagul and Green programs, you should talk about that later. Um, raise your hand. Like, yeah. Okay, uh, just a small thing that I've already experienced. She is uh, kind of given us an idea of what is, what are the optimistic points on which we can focus and he has rightly pointed out that uh, okay. best thing is get out of your chair and get out of, I should get out of my chair and do something instead of asking you or instead of ask, expecting Manmohan Singh to do something about it, let us accept that he cannot do property so let me do if I can. There is a small example which happened and which is making a very small impact. This year we got new textbooks for a particular subject, uh, Government Maharashtra SSE board textbook. And uh, I personally found the textbook to be horrible, not worth uh, of teaching to 10 standard kids, not because of uh, bad quality content, but because of the organization of the whole syllabus. I found that it was not up to the understanding level of the student. It was not as low as the understanding level of the students was. So, Right. And the textbook is there. <laughs> we have to teach. There is no option. Now we have to continue with that. And so we had a meeting of teachers, and every teacher came and shouted, "Are you so bad textbook? How will we teach? We will learn something from it. We will learn something from it. We will learn something from it." So we had a wonderful discussion. Chai piya, nashta kiya, enjoy kiya. Then going back home, I thought something has to be done. Fine, now the textbook has come this year, okay. Jo gini pig ho gaya, bachche unko kuch nahi. But agle saal kuch to karna chahiye. So what I did, what I did is found out the points jo mujhe laga isme galat hai. Ye bura hai, ye bachche ko nahi samajh mein aayega. Ye lesson nahi hona chahiye, kyunki ye reason hai. Ye cheez hona chahiye, kyunki ye reason hai. Aisa ek Excel sheet mein ek banaya document. Achcha se ek letter, covering letter banaya. Uska 25 copies nikala. Sent it to Pune board, sent it to Mumbai representatives, sent it to a few moderators of the board, and after a one month, I got a call from the board. Why do you? Why are you so much worried? <laughs> they are asking, why are you so much worried? Then nobody else is worried. I said, Baba, we are all worried, but we are not afraid to talk to you. So you are not afraid. Why are you not afraid? Why are you not afraid? I said, all of them are B.A. teachers, full-time job. If their job is out, they will not have anything to eat at home for eating. I am not a B.A. teacher, I am a part-time teacher and my job will come out, then I don't have a difference. I am doing more than 25 work, I will get to get money from where I am. I am not worried about losing my job. So he said, okay, now come and discuss. So now they are in the process of changing the book, making some few modifications which they feel can be practically done. They agreed to the fact that there were so many flaws and all that. So, if you have to do something to do, so, you have to do it yourself. But there is no other way that I keep on expecting somebody else comes and does it. Nobody is going to come and do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Very simple. That's the duty of a democracy. We have to follow the people of the people. Hi. So, I am not in the field of education. My question is, I recently took up art workshops with my one of the fellows at EFI. And uh, I had this problem in class, when I was taking up class, that there were special children in class. Visibly, they were special children. And uh, they had attention deficiency, retention deficiency, and they loved class because art was something that all, all these children liked. And then I asked the teachers, I'm like, if they are special students, and why are they in your class? And they said that the parents are unwilling to accept that the student cannot learn beyond a certain point. And they said we've, we've even gone and done IQ tests and stuff like that. And the parents are not willing. So the thing is, then I was questioning this and I went up to Sain Kodiwada and I found out like a lot more children who are like this. And I found that parents who have special uh, children or like they have le uh, slow learning children, they just give up on the child. Okay, they just be like, hi, school school jana hai to jane do, by himself if he feels like he will go. And there are some who are, uh, they, they're like, if he goes, it's okay, if he, whatever marks he gets, it's okay. They're not uh, interested in the child's education. So how do you bring about change in a parent who is like that? So it's not 
any more about the child because the child doesn't understand this anymore. And it's about the parent. How do you educate the parent to say that your child is not somebody who's going to be stupid for the rest of the life. And it's not like you want them to be a burden. It's not like they have to be a burden. There are cases where they don't have to be. And how do you educate the parent about this? It's a tough question that you ask. I mean, there's clearly no easy solution. There, it, there's quite a lot of social workers who work with parents to help them deal with the issues of these kinds of children. You should look at an NGO called UMI, U-M-W-E-D. It's run by Viva, and she's working with children and parents to address exactly this issue. There's a lot of research out there which actually says having uh, children like this in mainstream is actually beneficial for them. So do a little bit more research um, and reach out to me. This is the only thing that I can think of. Okay, we're going to ask the next two questions. We're running a little late, but I see lots of hands. Remember, we're going to go have snacks after this downstairs so we can all chat with Nina and Aditya as well over snacks. So can we actually have three questions together and then we decide like which one we want to take, etc. Uh, my question uh, to you would be, I would like to understand uh, what is the scale that you can achieve? And I have two questions in a sense that one is like uh, you had given an example about uh, your program being run in Rajasthan. So what percentage if you take of the total schools that would you be able to uh, touch through your program? And second question actually as a corollary to that is that how important is reaching everybody or is it okay to not reach 100% in order to bring change? So. So we are very small, we work only with about a thousand schools, but in the Indian NGO sector that's considered large. So, uh, but Rajasthan alone, I mean between Rajasthan, Gujarat and Maharashtra, which are the three states that uh, we work in, there are 150,000 schools. So we work in 1,000 out of 150,000, so which means we work in less than 1% of the schools. Uh, but I think the job of NGOs, in my opinion, is to innovate and then support transformation of government. The job NGOs is not to uh, take on everything. That's my personal point of view. So therefore, we wanted to do thousands so that we could demonstrate this is possible in a large enough number. At the same time, if I do it with just two, then you know you don't know what the issues are in doing a large enough number. So that's uh, uh, yeah. So we work in a very small percentage. But I think the job of NGOs and and non-government philanthropy is to demonstrate models, not take over government roles, uh, because we can never do it at the scale at which government wants. A lot of the work that we end up doing is actually finding these kinds of models that eventually scale through uh, the government uh, system. So I think a thousand, although it doesn't sound very large, is actually quite a large number. And I think it's the NGO that needs to work with the government to figure out what's the right point, at point at which the government's convinced that they'll take it. It's very easy to say the government will take it. The government doesn't want to take it. And even when they do, they're ready to give it out to somebody else again. So the other, on the other side, you'll have another NGO providing the service anyway. Um, so it's almost like we actually have to solve part of that problem. But the big scale solution for us in the country is working through government systems, for sure. There was a the news that Wipro has contributed a uh, lot of funds for this uh, upgrading school. So what exactly is the in which which of those five things they have contributed about? Upgrading school. Thank you. has been upgrading a number of different aspects of the schools, like infrastructure, the quality. Um, so in my case over here, it's probably only would come under uh, enrollment and infrastructure. It wouldn't really fall into a specific so case. Yeah, so I think uh, corporates are slowly, well, I mean, a lot of them are still just funding schools. Uh, and the entire schools are starting to now realize that investing in learning outcomes is actually important and investing in teachers. But the problem is the impact takes a while to show up. So if there's something that has short term and you can see it, it's a lot easier to get funding for it. And so there is still attention even in the corporate funding side that it's easier to fund the infrastructure piece rather than actually the learning piece. But we're starting to see more enlightened folks that are willing to invest in the longer run to actually improve uh, learning outcomes. 
But there's still a challenge where they're not yet uh, willing to fund other nonprofits. So we work a lot with trying to say, don't implement, don't create your own schools. Go and fix the existing schools right now. But it takes a lot of education uh, to convert them. I wanted to ask if you um, do have worked with night schools or and how difficult it becomes or, or how different it becomes from uh, working from uh, usual day schools, students. And so there's, Ma you know Masum, is that why you're asking? Do you know an NGO called Masum? So Masum is a very good school, works with night, uh, night schools. She's done a great job in, in actually scaling. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, at least, that we saw with Masum children is that they work all day, that by the time they're coming in the evening to school, they're actually quite exhausted. So, be, so to actually be able to deliver a meaningful curriculum uh, in the given time frame and the stress that it places on the children is a challenge. But I think they are gaining ground in trying to work and break down that curriculum so it is more manageable. But you should definitely meet Masum, it's based in Bombay. Hello. Thank you. So my question is a bit technical one, you can dodge this question. So uh, the DASRA basically works as a facilitator and monitoring and evaluation has been a buzzword in development sector of late. Uh, and you work as a facilitator, and kind of you match philanthropists with the NGOs, you think that they are doing fantastic work, and you talk about Muktangan as well. How do you evaluate, because these NGOs are working in fields of behavioral changes, attitudinal changes, progressive pedagogy, how do you evaluate uh, that which is doing good and which is working to scale up? But the, what are the evaluation parameters, and have we developed these things in kind of development sector to have those competencies and frameworks to evaluate this? And also because you talked about ASAR, uh, EIS and the NCRT data that are available, well, look, those three kind of give very uh, different stories all together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's two questions. Did, he, did you plant that question? I know he's one of your people. Sure, he's brainwashed. Um, so your, uh, your first question, we're working on it, yeah? The, the m &E piece has not been solved, as in the evaluation piece is not solved. I think for us a big question is how much time does an NGO spend on trying to track and do the evaluation as opposed to the actual work? And I think that you have to find a balance being on the side that we're on. And so we, what we try to do is evaluate what they're able to evaluate initially. So we really just take what you already do. And based on that, try and decide where the impact really is, where is the scale possible. Once you move in to become part of Dasar's portfolio, we do invest in trying to build more rigorous systems around monitoring and gathering data, and then working with the organization for them to use it for their decision making, of which the next step is to actually look at the impact piece, rather than the other way around. Now, our donors don't necessarily like that, but we strongly feel that that's important in terms of the capacity building for that organization. But there's no easy framework, there's no sort of, we don't do complicated random control trials and all these ridiculous things that cost more than the program itself. But you know at the same time the reality is to move to a Gates Foundation, to a MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, these large international funding opportunities require you to have some of these kinds of studies and so we actually work quite a lot with universities and others to get it done at a very low cost. For me, the big piece is efficiency and cost. At the end of the day, is it really having an impact ultimately on the children is more important than can we really track a whole lot of things. Your next question is a valid one. I think my point was more that there, there is data available rather than these three are the most accurate, I think. The issue is, is that there is data, data that differs, but the fact is that they differ and that that is part of the discussion and allows us to, to move numbers in either way or actually question. So I'm going to take the liberty of asking the last question. Sorry, you can ask them later. Unless it's like deep and meaningful and we really regret not asking. <laughs> My suspicion is hers is going to be more interesting than yours. Okay, then fine. <laughs> Well, it was actually to see uh, how or if it's possible um, to see how crowdfunding can be a component in 
either developing schools or play an important aspect in education because right now uh, I know for a fact that there's a there's a school in Murshidabad where a very young 16 year old is trying to, to, to build it and he's a Yeah, Papa. Yeah. Um, very good idea. This is what I mean. Uh, I mean, so this idea is coming out of this. This is an idea lab. I mean, what can we do? You know, you can crowdsource for a school right next to yourself, right? You can crowdsource volunteers for a school right next to your home. You can. I mean, these are the opportunities for us. We are not disabled. We can go and do stuff in the schools right next to our homes, and that's the beauty. So just go ahead and do that, and country be a beautiful place. I'm not as much of a free spirit, I suppose, as Aditya is. I do think you need a facilitator, you need a platform, right? It's not so... You, you can go and you can have a 16-year-old who, who does it. But I think if you actually go to a platform and, and try to use something that exists to build upon that, it's more likely that you will actually gain some traction on this crowdsourcing piece. There are existing technology platforms you can move to to do these kinds of fundraising things. The question becomes, where does the money go, who tracks it? Mm -hmm. There are larger questions that do impact the effectiveness of it, but... And then as you scale up, as you scale up and as you, you know, need more and go beyond, you need, you need the kind of processes that, let's say that you ensure, right? So I'm going to end with the last. Remember, we're going to be having snacks downstairs. We can have conversations over there. But, you know, since this is, a, it's a mixed audience, it's corporate students, etc. It's literally citizens of, 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 of Bombay and India. Can you all just give us in a few seconds what we can do when we leave this room? Of course, there's no easy pills, but we've, we said it's a very positive, feel-good Children's Day funder. What can we do in our lives? Now, not all of us can are willing to you know leave our jobs and dedicate our lives to the causes like you all have. But what can we do within our lives um, to improve, say, uh, the quality of Indian children's education? Things that we can do in a, within our regular lives. I mean, there's a range of things you can do. Uh, I think start close to home. Start with friends. Start with people who work for you. Start with uh, your community schools. I think things that you're attached to or work with regularly is a, a good place to start. If you want to do more and bigger and better things, come and reach out to the store and we'll find something for you. So I'm not very good at this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> I don't know, it depends on what you feel like doing. <laughs> Start from there, the individual is the source of all change. And uh, I think the struggle within yourself to find something meaningful is the journey itself. Uh, and that's very important. So I mean, we can all go and sweep the road because one of your friends is going to sweep the road, but that's not going to change the country. The struggle within ourselves, creation of a democracy involves each individual citizen being a thinking individual who thinks about what type of country he wants to build and goes and makes one step in that direction. That is a democracy. And so if your critical thinking individuals visualize what you want your country to be like, visualize what you need your state to be like, your city to be like, and do one step in that direction, and then it's great because then I get into more and more discussions with other people who are taking it in other directions and that's all. So I don't care what you do. I just say build the country uh, from a small, and to build the country includes just, you know, a super thing like picking up the wrapper on the road and putting it in the kachra. For me, that's part of building the country because that is meaningful for me. And I think that's very important. To see what is meaningful to me and doing it, I think is a beautiful way of living. <laughs>